Sometimes happily ever after isn't the whole story. Sometimes the bad guy has his day and we're all booked on a one-way ticket to Glumtown. Forget it, Jake. It's Glumtown. That did not work. We've done a video before, eight awesome movies where the bad guy wins, but what about when you think the good guy's won? But if you look closely, you'll see the villain has pulled a sneaky schoolboy for the three count. That's a wrestling reference, by the way. I quite like wrestling. I'm Adam from WhatCulture.com and here are 10 movie villains you didn't realize actually won. Number 10, Donica, Man of Tai Chi. Surprisingly cast villain Keanu Reeves' Donica is without a doubt the most interesting thing about Man of Tai Chi, the figurehead of a tournament reminiscent of a more realistic Mortal Kombat. He's as ruthless as he is stoic and he's played by Keanu Reeves, so that's loads. His plan is to corrupt an initially reluctant fighter to the dark side and make him a killer. And though that fighter's head is initially turned by money, he does eventually refuse to fight the opponent chosen as his first victim, which would have been a moral triumph if he hadn't then accepted Donica's challenge to a final fight and killed him instead, becoming the killer his victim always wanted him to be. Rut row. Number 9, Mr. Glass, Unbreakable. The antagonist of M. Night Shyamalan's excellent comic book riff Unbreakable is Samuel L. Jackson, and the L stands for fragile. Elijah Price suffers from a rare condition that renders his bones extremely brittle, and he seeks out his binary opposite, who is unbreakable. Like a true comic villain, he sets out to prove his opposite's existence by killing loads of people in the hope that someone will survive. That's mental. Eventually discovering Bruce Willis's David Dunn, he prompts the discovery of his special abilities and in essence creates his own arch nemesis, which is exactly the victory he was seeking. Sure, he might end the film locked up, but he has basically affirmed his own existence and that's his life's work. Number 8, the fashion industry, Zoolander. Although it perpetuates the stereotypes that models are all looks and no brains, the brilliant Zoolander never really comes across as mean-spirited. The only people who don't come out unscathed are the fashion industry moguls who are presented as wankers. But that's fine, because the good guys triumph in the end and the day is saved, right? Well, it would be if we chose to forget about the rest of the evil fashion moguls who are left to freely continue their evil practices. Mugatu may have been arrested, but he's not even the big fish. There are clearly more evil people pulling his strings, and when you think about it, it's really quite a sinister conclusion, which is saying something for a Ben Stiller comedy. Number 7, The Nazis, The Great Escape. Featuring the most entertaining game of single-player catch ever put on film, The Great Escape is an undisputed classic. It displayed the plucky spirit of the Allies even when they were held captive under the tyrannical jackboot of the Nazis. It also proved that it's cool to jump over things on motorbikes, which is science. While the darkness of the subject matter certainly isn't shied away from, the style manages to bring some lightness and levity to an otherwise somber period of history. And yet, the depressing truth about what happened to the escapees. The actual prison break went down in much the same way, and like in the film, the majority of those who made a break for it were either captured or they were killed. Number 6, Society Falling Down. In Falling Down, society and societal decay specifically is the villain. William defends Foster, decides he's had enough, and makes it his mission to put right the wrongs he sees in the world. He's been pushed over the edge by an age he just can't relate to anymore, which is how I felt when Dub Smash became a thing. Is it still a thing? I don't care. It's hard not to back Foster, who has lost both his job and his family as he tries to combat social decline. In the end, society triumphs over Foster. While he may get his point across and go out on his own terms, he hasn't really changed anything. It was a fun ride, but all of the problems he faced have continued and arguably gotten worse with time. Number 5, Hans Lander in Glorious Bastards. Beloved and despised in equal measure. Wait, no he isn't. He's a Nazi. He's despised. Hans Lander was able to turn any situation to his advantage, even using Hitler's downfall as an opportunity to create a new life for himself in the USA. As we all know, this doesn't go quite to plan for him as Brad Pitt's Lieutenant Aldo Rain wipes the wicked grin from his face by carving a swastika into it. Score one for America, right? Wrong. It's not like they killed him, and after all, when he gets to the States, he's free to demand that the damage be repaired. Uh, that scarring would be a relatively easy fix even back then, leaving him to enjoy the new life he so cunningly manoeuvred himself into. Number four, Alex DeLarge, a clockwork orange. A fan of Beethoven, drug lace milk, and of course, a bit of the old ultra -vibe. Violence, Alex Delarge is a scamp and one of the darkest examples of youth in revolt. His wanton carnage cannot last forever though, and Alex's past eventually catches up to him. He's tortured, reconditioned, and abandoned by those closest to him. It seems like he's got his comeuppance, but then flash forward to him in hospital, having survived a suicide attempt which has been provoked by one of his past victims. The correctional officers all gather round him despite having brutalized him previously and lord him as a success story for their brainwashing program. Alex plays along and smiles for all their pictures, but the reality of his condition is revealed in his final narration. He's not playing their game. He's the same old person he always was. Hooray! Way to go, Alex, you person who I'm suddenly remembering. Yes, you're a murderous f***ing asshole. Number three, Tyler Durden, Fight Club. Making soap, sticking it to the man, and fighting round the world. Tyler Durden is anarchy with abs. Really, really nice abs. 
Um, in the gripping conclusion to Fight Club, we learn that Durden has ordered his minions to level skyscrapers housing credit card companies. The ultimate middle finger to capitalism ensures, at least in the film's universe, that credit history will be erased and everyone will be brought to the same level. This forces a narrator to directly confront and kill his alter ego and live happily ever after. Needle scratch. In reality, this doesn't really end the destruction of an entire city block and Project Mayhem ends up being successful regardless. Durden's legacy is cemented and whatever the narrator chooses to do next in his life, probably get arrested for blowing up dem buildings, his life has been irrevocably changed, which was the point of creating this violent alternate personality in the first place. Number two, Mr. Potter, It's a Wonderful Life. The classic Jimmy Stewart Christmas movie contains one of the most loathsome pieces of shit in movie history. No, not Mr. Potter, I mean Uncle Goddamn Billy. You had one job, Uncle Billy. George needed that eight grand and you just fucking lose it? You're the worst person to world, you shit-eating son of a bitch! Anyway, Mr. Potter, the dude who owns half the town, is a copper-bottom bag in his own right. He steals the eight grand, and despite George realizing at the end of the film that his life is worth a damn, nothing happens to Mr. Potter at the end of the movie. He's still powerful, he's still a butt munch, no one likes a butt munch, and he still gets to keep the eight grand, which is over $100,000 in today's money. Seriously, you, Uncle Billy. And number one, Raoul Silver Skyfall. Raoul Silver was Bond's nemesis in 2012's critically acclaimed Skyfall, played with theatricality and chest rubbing by Javier Bardem. He spent the whole film one step ahead of everyone, often implausibly so. How did you know the train would arrive at that precise time, Raoul? No answer me. And even at the end of the film, succeeded in completely destroying 007's childhood home. His ultimate goal in the movie was to assassinate the head of MI6, Judy Dench's M. It's explained that she denied his affiliation to the agency after he was captured whilst on a mission for them, leading to him suffering traumatic facial injuries from an out-of-date cyanide capsule. And you know what? That's fair enough. In the climactic standoff, Bond kills Silver with a knife, but not before the flamboyant psychopath has completed his objective of doing in M. That sounded wrong. Sure, Silver dies, but he got the revenge he craved, and if anything, Bond did him a favor by killing him, allowing the guy to go to his grave at his moment of triumph. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter here. I'm Adam from WhatCulture.com, and I'll see you soon.